You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. They call them quick disconnect valves, but apparently on the International Space Station, they don't always live up to their name. One of them that connected a faulty ammonia pump to the station's cooling system sent NASA into a tiger team frenzy of troubleshooting and head scratching this week. First time they tried to disconnect it, it sprang a huge leak of ammonia. Nasty stuff. So they reattached it and then tried again on the next spacewalk. At first it wouldn't budge. But in the end, the solution was precisely what you or I would have done if it was a pipe under the sink at home. They shook the darn thing like crazy until it came free. Spacewalker Doug Wheels Wheelock employed the elbow grease. His spacewalking sidekick, Tracy Caldwell Dyson, at his side. It was the second spacewalk to replace the pump to get that cooling system back online. When it failed, the station had one other set of operative radiators, but the reduced capability created a significant brownout for the six-person crew. Veteran astronaut and spacewalker Dave Wolf was helping lead the effort on the ground to figure out how to solve the case of the stubborn valve. I spoke with him via Skype. Dave Wolf, good to have you with us on This Week in Space. Uh, you know this piece of gear really well. Back in 2002, you installed it. Uh, give us, try to give us an understanding of what they were encountering there in space and, and what the problems were. Yeah, thank you, Miles. Good to be with you. So a good way to think about this is as though it were a car, an automobile, with two radiators. And the car will run fine on one radiator, but we have a backup. We have two cooling systems on the space station. And we've lost one of those cooling systems that's necessary to reject all the heat produced by the avionics and other. So we've lost half of our cooling system. So it's essentially like that car with two radiators uh, running on its last radiator, and, and we really need that last radiator. So the removal and the replacement of the pump, which failed, uh, that, that was designed to be uh, something that was done by spacewalkers. But they ran into some trouble. What were the issues they ran into? Uh, that, that's right. So there's very large connectors that contain the ammonia under high pressure. The coolant in this system is ammonia. We operated at almost 400 pounds per square inch, very high pressure. When they were actuating the valve, close one of those valves so they could remove it and change the, the pump, uh, it started leaking. Uh, and, uh, and that led, led to some problems that uh, got us off our planned schedule. And that leak was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? Did uh, anybody expect that? Well, we, we somewhat knew it could happen. We've had leaks before. We, we know that these quick disconnects, it's a bit of a misnomer. They're very bulky. Uh, <clears> these <throat> system disconnects. Um, they've leaked before. We've had problems with them before. They're finicky. We've built special tools to handle them, special techniques to handle them. So, uh, yeah, we, we know we can get into problems with these. So it didn't surprise you that much. And so you had to get into troubleshooting mode. You had to put some Tiger teams together. Was it difficult doing the troubleshooting? So yes, it, it really was because there's several sets of seals. They're fairly complex, and, and it's never clear whether it's ice inside the quick disconnect uh, causing a deformation of a seal, or did we gouge a surface? Did we tear a seal? We're not sure of the mechanism. That was important here because we didn't know ahead whether if we tried it again, if we, which we needed to do, would it leak again? Or did we have to build a whole new plan? Uh, and so we built both plans going into yesterday's spacewalk. So you were, you were uh, burning the midnight oil, you and the team, trying to come up with a, a new plan for these guys up in space. That's right. Uh, a rather large team. You know, usually we spend a year, year and a half from de development and planning, checklist, building, testing, and execution. And here we have all that compressed into you know, a matter of four or five days. 
So what, what you did obviously in the end worked, but I, I think anybody who's worked on, on plumbing at their house or done any home improvement appreciates the fact that what, what Wheels did was just basically shake it like crazy. But, uh, well, that was part of what he did. And, you know, this is a lot like a, a farm implement with a hydraulic system of sorts. And you know, everybody knows those are messy and you like to reduce the pressure to as low as you can before you operate them. And uh, the other part of the problem here, Miles, is that ammonia is like gold to us up there. With the shuttle ending soon, we can't just take up all the ammonia tanks we want. And when we planned all these maintenance procedures, we did have a shuttle planned to be around for the long run. And so we could have dumped all the ammonia, taken this system to vacuum, and handled it more straightforward. But we try, we're trying to preserve all that valuable coolant, that ammonia, so we have to operate it at much higher pressure to, to retain that in the system. So really what this is, this is a little uh, taste of what it is going to be like to operate the station without the shuttle. It's going to create little problems and maybe down the road some bigger problems not having that capability. It, it sure does. It, it throws a real wrench in the plans that the shuttle is exceptionally capable, as you well know, at, at both taking parts up and bringing them down. Uh, for example, uh, I don't believe we have more pump modules on the ground, but we could repair the one that's up in space if we could get it back. Uh, so things like that, uh, the shuttle's capability will be missed. Yeah. Does anybody know why the pump failed at this point? Have you gotten that far? Well, uh, I'll jump a, out on a limb a little bit. Uh, the, the early indications uh, show some current spikes very consistent with your classic uh, motor winding uh, short. All right. Well, I, I assume you're tired and uh, ready for a little bit of rest, and I assume you feel like the, the, you, you're over the hump on this one and that the, the, the replacement should go fairly straightforwardly. But, well, it does feel like we're over the, it feels that way, but when you step back, you realize that Monday, if things go to our plan, we'll be putting in the new pump well, that entails all the kinds of procedures we've been doing. So that, that's really the big step is putting in the new one. We've just been taking the old one out up till now. So we have a lot of road in front of us here. So you see, you're not, uh, you're not taking anything for granted. No, not at all. We're really on our toes here and uh, we're trying not to uh, feel like we're done here. We're, we're staying very alert and on top of this. All right, we'll check in with you midweek. Dave Wolf, thanks for taking time. I know you're tired and need a little rest. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Miles. Former NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe and his teenage son Kevin survived a horrific plane crash in Alaska this week that killed five people, including former Senator Ted Stevens. They were on a fishing trip when the amphibious twin otter they were in plowed into the side of a mountain in bad weather. Both O'Keefe's are banged up pretty badly, but they are expected to survive. Sean served as NASA administrator from 2002 to 2005. He was sent there by the Bush White House to tighten the reins on the space station budget. He ended up leading the agency through the Columbia accident and offered up a textbook example of expert crisis management. Sean was the man who signed on to the idea of sending yours truly into space, an idea that ended with the loss of Columbia. He's a good friend, and I wish him and Kevin a speedy recovery. Four, three, Atlas engine ignition, zero, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying AEHF-1 for the United States Air Force. Such was the scene at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida this weekend. That's an Atlas V rocket, and the payload is the AEHF-1 satellite. It's one of what will be a network of four military satellites designed to provide global, secure, protected, and jam-resistant communications for our armed forces. Hopefully, troops will have better communication than I get with my AT&T iPhone. Good news, Space Tweeps, it's official. NASA will hold another tweet up at KSC for the next shuttle launch. That's STS-133, currently scheduled for November 1st. But you knew that. 
They are fantastic events, and if you're prone to tweet, you really should put your 140 characters in the ring. This is a good way to satisfy your assignment to see a shuttle launch before it's too late. Registration opens at noon on Tuesday, August 24th, closes noon Wednesday, August 25th. If you want to know more, go to www.nasa.gov slash tweetup. Hard to believe it's now been six years since the Cassini spacecraft arrived at Saturn. And it's still a very busy space probe. So busy, it just got another extension through 2017, giving it a chance to observe the summer solstice in Saturn's northern hemisphere. Here's a cool new movie from Cassini. The spacecraft was getting some close-up images of Saturn's F-ring and purely by chance captured these images of a globular star cluster passing through the field of view. That's NGC 5139 or Omega Centauri, nearly 16,000 light years away. As long as we're talking clusters, here's a long exposure Hubble Space Telescope image of a galaxy in the Coma Cluster, 320 million light years away. This is a spiral galaxy called NGC 9411, captured face on. And the Hubble folks have all kinds of questions about this picture of NGC 4696. This galaxy is not a perfect spiral. In fact, it curls around itself, kind of like a question mark. Astronomers are scratching their heads. They have a lot of questions about why it's shaped so strangely and what those filaments that stretch out from it might be. We'll let you know if they find some answers. Hubble is the third of a triumvirate of telescopes NASA calls the Great Observatories. The other two are Chandra and Spitzer. Together, these space scopes see the universe in the optical, X-ray, and infrared wavelengths. Now imagine if they could work together, like the Justice League. Well, this is a composite image, a super space scopes mashup of two colliding galaxies located about 62 million light years away. The Chandra data is blue, the Hubble data is golden brown, and the Spitzer data is red. These so-called antennae galaxies started colliding about 100 million years ago, and they're home to highly active star-forming regions. To infinity and beyond, indeed. Two anniversaries worth noting this week. 50 years ago, NASA launched ECHO-1, its first communication satellite. It was basically just a big Mylar balloon, able to bounce television, radio, and other signals cross-country and even across continents. Let's listen to a message from President Dwight Eisenhower. This is President Eisenhower speaking. It is a great personal satisfaction to participate in this first experiment in communications. And five years ago, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter launched to the Red Planet and soon started sending back pictures like these. MRO has become a workhorse for NASA, imaging the surface of Mars with unprecedented clarity, scanning for minerals and water, monitoring Martian weather, and serving as a communications relay for robotic missions on the surface. Which brings us to our favorite simulated Mars mission. Well, I guess it's the only simulated Mars mission. You know it by now, six men entered a human-sized hamster habitat in Moscow and will spend 520 days there pretending to go to Mars, explore the surface, and then come back. We've now gone past the 70-day mark, which means they're about 15% done. And the video diaries they are posting on YouTube show no signs of reality show-style discontent. Here is Romaine Charles showing one of the highlights, I guess, air sampling. Hi, Roman. Tell us what you're doing there in the middle of the living room. I'm just doing some air sampling on these glycerin filters. So I must be very careful because there will be some culture on this glycerin and nothing must touch it. So, Romain, what's up with the white socks and sandals and the wife beater t-shirt? I think that's a fashion don't on Mars as well. Just saying. And on that note, I'm out of here. You can email us at twist at spaceflightnow.com, tweet us at This Week in Space. The blog version of this podcast is at milesobrien.com. But here is the most important thing. Please go to spaceflightnow.com slash twist and send us a few bucks, will you? We really need your help. And if you don't, 
I'll start wearing a wife beater and white socks and sandals. Is that extortion? Sort of, I suppose. Thanks to our most loyal sponsor ever, Binary Space. We really appreciate your support. And we'll see you next time.